And today we have Chuck Benson from the University of Washington. He is the director of the Internet of Things Risk Mitigate, Mitigation Strategy work that's going on there. And he has agreed to talk a little bit today about uh, a book that he just finished or will be finishing soon uh, in the topic of uh, mitigating Internet of Things systems risks at institutions. So Chuck, I'll turn it over to you and I will watch the chat room and relay any questions that come in. Okay, that sounds great. Um, thanks, Jason. I appreciate the opportunity and it's great to uh, speak to everybody. I think it's good to have these, um, these kinds of talks and these kinds of discussions. So it helps us uh, co-evolve some language around IoT and IoT systems. And because it's so new, uh, we, we're all trying to get our heads and our hands around it. So uh, a little bit of back background on me is uh, Jason said, I've got this um, a new role here at the university. It was made specifically to look at uh, to, uh, mitigating IoT systems risk uh, within, the, within the university. I've been at the UW for about 15 years. I was down in health sciences uh, for about six, school of medicine for a couple. Then I, the last bit that I did, I ran IT for facility services for uh, about six years. I've done some other IoT risk mitigation works uh, while I've been here as, as well. I, um, I, there's a, there's a book coming out this summer on IoT systems manageability with uh, Taylor and Francis. A couple summers ago, I had a chapter in a book on this, uh, this creating, analyzing, and sustaining smarter cities. I was also in IoT systems. Uh, about a year ago, I was asked to testify before the U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission regarding uh, IoT risk mitigation for institutions and cities. I've got a, a couple of articles in the uh, Educal's Review, some other articles in different publications. I've also got a blog if you're interested, uh, longtailrisk.com. So uh, the thing about IoT, you know, and none of this is none of this to say, uh, well, just don't do IoT, right? Because we can't, we can't do that. And then higher education institute, institutions, and I think national labs as well, uh, regional networks, uh, we, we can't just not play. So speaking uh, uh, specifically for uh, uh, universities, higher education institutions, we, we've got to be in this game because this is where a lot of things are going to happen. We see it in the uh, student faculty, staff safety, uh, tons of stuff in research, lots in loading environments, energy management is a, is a big piece, lots in clinical, traffic parking management, security, all these pieces. So it's, 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 all, it's all there and it's, and it's not going away. And so, so it has to be, we, we have to be in the game. We just, we can't like say, okay, we're just, we're not going to do it. And I also think it's an opportunity, or it, I think it will be a competitive differentiator for differentiator for uh, universities, because I think those organizations that can implement and manage IoT systems well are going to tend to retain uh, researchers, particularly scientific researchers, because they're going to be able to do their research and not have to monkey with multiple organizations within the institution trying to get their IoT systems to run. I, I think they're going to tend to stay, and I think they're going to tell a colleague, they're going to tell a friend to say, you know, it's, it's pretty good here. Conversely, organizations that don't implement IoT systems well are going to have the opposite thing happen, and I, I think researchers will get frustrated, and they'll tend to not want to stay, and they'll also tell a colleague that they're not going to want to stay. So I, I think doing this well is very important. So today we'll go through... Uh, I'll break this down roughly, roughly, and what I see is at least six differences between IoT and IoT systems and traditional uh, IT or traditional enterprise IT. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about a couple of criteria we can look at for determining IoT systems implementation success. So you know, how do we know if we did a good job or not? And then systems manageability, and uh, particularly manageability within our resource constrained environments. Uh, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about how we're approaching risk mitigation at the UW. And I'll, I'll touch briefly on this, uh, that testimony that I did last year at the uh, U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission. And then we can uh, open it up for uh, discussion. So to, to me, there's, there's at least six big differences with IoT systems from traditional enterprise IT. One is just the raw number of things. You know, each, of these, each of these things is a, it's a device that computes, it's networked, and it interacts with the environment some way. So just the raw numbers of those and the rate of growth of those, is, that's just very different from what we've seen before. Another thing is uh, 
uh, variation and variability. There's a lots of different types of things. You know, there's energy management systems, there's Fitbit systems, there's clinical systems, there's network surveillance systems, there's other kinds of research systems. So there, there's all these different things and there's new things that are coming online all the time. So it's, it's with that kind of um, variability and that kind of growth and variability, it's hard to get things into conventional risk buckets. So that makes it challenging. And also there's, there's variation within each thing. There's multiple components within a single device. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So there's a lot of different types of things, a lot of different types of systems. And then, and then within each thing or each device, there's a lot of variation within that as well. Uh, related to that, there's, there's a lack of language for uh, talking about this. This stuff is so new, it doesn't fall into conventional kind of uh, uh, buckets. We have a hard time uh, even having good conversations with it. Uh, and it also tends to span many different organizations, which leads to the next one. You know, an IoT system, when it gets, for example, deployed in a building, it's, uh, if, it's, if it's a big IoT system, say in a research facility, it might be involved, the planning and budgeting group might be involved, finance might be involved, capital development might be involved, uh, facilities management might be involved, central IT will certainly be involved, local IT might be involved, lots of vendors. So there, there's, these systems tend to span multiple organizations within an institution. And these, and these organizations are not typically used to interacting with each other on this kind of topic. So that, that's, that's uh, kind of a big new thing. Another aspect is that these uh, devices can be uh, out of sight and out of mind. You know, in the, the traditional kind of risk management of computers, and we've got desktops, we've got phones, we've got tablets, we've got, you know, racks in a data center, um, even VMs, you know, uh, virtual machines and, and racks in a data center. They're, they're, we, can, we can sort of envision those. And, and when we can envision them, we can kind of count them. But what we don't think about is these sensors that are embedded all around us, like the rooms that you guys are uh, sitting in probably right now, uh, there's a good chance it's got HVAC sensors that are connected to the internet, either directly there or back at a panel somewhere, you know, a few feet away. And we don't think about these sensors, which are, they're again, computing devices, they're networked, they're interacting with the environment some way. We, they're just being built in around us and then there's just more and more of that as we go forward. So we tend not to think about these as computing devices. So we tend not to naturally want to manage risk around them. And then finally, an area where I, I think this is different, IoT systems are different from traditional IT, is that there's a, a lack of precedent for implementation. And as, as a sector, we're not, we're not good at it. So you know, what happens, a lot of these systems can say, these technical systems can fall into uh, the facilities management realm or the group, uh, and the institution is doing capital development that's, you know, that's build, putting up buildings. And they're not used to doing that. They've been doing other things. Uh, and all of a sudden, they're kind of in the technology business. And by the same token, when these systems kind of show up with the central IT group, well, that's a technical group, but they're not used to deploying devices way out in the field and in boiler rooms and up on light poles. And so it's, um, it, 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 it crosses, and we're not, we're not good at coordinating between the two right now. So we, we all know what exponential growth looks like, but to actually plot it, it's, to me, it's kind of an eye-opening. I've, I've come across in literature that, uh, one, uh, that the growth rates I've seen you know, between 20% and 35%, you know, who knows if it's in between those two or not, but those are a couple numbers that are out there. And it, but it does appear to be exponential from the, from the stuff that I've read, at least for the next few years. So if we plot that, Let's say we start with 10,000 devices on a, in an institution's campus. Uh, like for example, I think you know, estimating 10,000 devices here at the, at the UW is not unreasonable. You get some pretty big numbers pretty quickly. And I, I think, uh, you know, and if we have a hard time managing the devices we have now, how is that gonna be going forward? When, these, when the number of devices is increasing so rapidly. So uh, back on that variability and variation thing. So within each device, there's, there's multiple components. You know, there could be, and, and, it, and it can vary of course, but there's uh, some piece of hardware and it's gonna be a sensor or some kind of actuator. It's gonna be some kind of hardware driver that goes with that. There may or may not be an OS. Uh, there may be some um, 
memory on board. And if so, there's probably some memory, memory management software. There's some, uh, it can be some business logic software. There could be some encryption, could be a network stack. Well, there would be a network stack. Uh, there's a variety of different wireless protocols. It could be web services, could be something else. And, and this is for each device. And each one of these, these things could come from multiple different vendors. For example, it's not unusual to see um, uh, device makers use certain web services vendors that are they they're specifically made to do web services on devices. So, but we don't know where these things come from, um, and that's that can make it interesting too. So we don't know where these different components come from, and whoever provides those, they could actually sub the work out too. So we really don't know what we're putting in our institutions, cities, campuses, I meaning by the hundreds or thousands or more. Uh, so that makes it an interesting. Uh, issue as well. So on the, the many different organizations part, the, uh, the, the math on this can get interesting, I think, because we have, we have a lot of different parties involved, a lot of different organizations in, involved, and there's, there's an increasing amount of interdependence between each of these parties, between each of these organizations. And that, that not that every single organization or, or party touches every other one, but there's a, there's a fair amount of uh, uh, interacting with another group or a person. And when that happens, that actually takes some time. You know, it's either emails, scheduling meetings, having phone calls, doing follow-up. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a relationship to be managed. And the, what's interesting to me with the math is that that, is that number gets bigger as we look at lower right-hand column there, uh, lower right-hand corner there. The um, as we add more, the number as we add more organizations or vendors, as we add more, the number of relationships between the whole thing grows a lot faster. So you know, by the time we get down to say six different you know nodes or organizations or vendors, we got 15 different relationships. We add one more, and it jumps to 21 different relationships. So it's so it's things like that. There, there's some kind of subtle math in there, which things get more complicated quickly and, we're, and we get kind of surprised by that. I just, that's what I think and I think that kind of creates this uh, uh, additional complexity and drain on what the things that we're trying to do. So for me, I, I was trying to figure out uh, what's, what does success look like? How do we know we've done a good job of implementing an IoT system? And I think it's important for us to ask this question and to develop that organizational maturity to ask these questions. So I break it down into two kind of overarching criteria. One is ROI. Is does the thing that we put in is it actually doing what we thought it would do for the what the cost of what we thought the uh, what we thought the cost would be? And that's actually not that's not trivial to uh, to figure out. The because the return could have the value of that system could mean different things to different groups. So that, that can be challenging, but also the, the cost, where that cost gets borne out, uh, that could be hard to figure out too. But I think we, we need to get good at least estimating what ROI is. Uh, we, need to, we need to be asking these questions. And the other part is, in the course of implementing this IoT system, let's say it's a you know, video surveillance system, we put in 300 cameras across a campus or something. Um, did we, did we make the institution worse off from a cybersecurity point of view in the course of this implementation? So for example, did we pay a vendor to come in and install 300 uh, cameras at different locations, but we didn't tell them to turn off default username and password. We didn't put it on a, maybe a, a segment. We, uh, we didn't tell them to turn off unnecessary services. We didn't tell them to um, tell us where they are, tell us what the firmware versions are. So we want to ask ourselves, then when we put these things in, did we actually make ourselves worse off? So there's two things I think we want to, we want to get good at asking. Are, what is the ROI of, a, of any particular installation? Because there's going to be a lots of IoT systems and uh, implementations. And then the cyber risk profile. Did we make the institution worse off in the course of putting it in? So and a comment on costing is, uh, I call this a, a, guy, uh, a guy a truck and a ladder problem, or a guy, uh, a guy is a uh, women and men. The, on some of these endpoints, there it could be, like in this picture here, it's taken, it's right down the street from where I am. Uh, there's someone working in, down in the 
down underground, or it might be up on a light pole, or it might be on the, embedded in a ceiling of a building. These things can be hard to get to, and it's non-trivial to install them and service them and maybe replace them. So toward the bottom, I've got a uh, hypothetical example. Let's say you're doing, you, your organization's put in 500 air sensors across, uh, across your campus, um, and that has to be serviced. So you can figure, let's say you take um, a skilled trades person, maybe it's uh, two hours of prep time, uh, four hours on site of troubleshooting repair, uh, two hours recovery, uh, you put the tools back, driving the truck back, completing the work order. So you take that time, you say there's at least two tradespeople, and let's say 75 bucks an hour with, with uh, including benefits. That's coming out to around 1200 bucks per support event. Now, again, these are hypotheticals, so work whatever numbers in here that, you, that work for you. But let's say you have, you have uh, 500 devices deployed across your organization, you get a 10% uh, repair, troubleshoot rate per year. That number can come up, you know, that's starting to aggregate up to around 60 grand. Uh, so that's these deploying and servicing and uh, replacing these endpoints. Uh, it's, it's costly. Uh, and I think we're not, we're not good at doing that kind of math yet. So when we do ROI, we want to capture, we want to try to capture all those things. So on, on manageability, and there's this kind of quintessential question we have to ask ourselves, I think, is can we manage what we own? So that blue line going up there, that's like that exponential growth line we, we saw a while ago. And that yellow line underneath I drew out there is uh, depicting our ability as an institution to our ability to manage that device count, which is growing so rapidly. Now, and that, so that yellow line there, the, that ability to manage is, is arbitrary. I just drew it up. I'd say, okay, I think it's, it might be doing this. It might not be doing that. It might be, going flat, it might even be going down, I don't know. But what I, what I do know is that ability to manage is not growing at the rate that the device count is growing. So every day we get, or every month, we get more devices, and every month it increased, the, the number of devices increased, not only, not only increased, but it increased faster than it did the previous month. So as we step out that delta between our ability to manage and the device count, that just gets bigger and bigger. And that's a big concern of mine. Yeah, you know, we're, we are, of course, concerned with you know, deployments we already have. We want to look at those and mitigate. We want to find those, look at those, mitigate those. But this rate of growth is what is the eye opener for me and I, what we can do uh, to get our place, or ourselves in a place where we can manage these things better. So a moral note, can we manage what we own? So we get all these devices coming onto our, our campuses or our labs, but we're only managing a small fraction because they, they, they can come in from all these different sources and they're not all coming in from one, coming in from one central bedded uh, place. They can come in a lot of different, a lot of different ways. So, so these, these devices and these IOT systems show up on our, in our institutions and in our cities. And then in some subset of that, it's just the things you can enumerate. You know, that it just if, say you just wanna count the things. You just wanna count the, the devices. That's, you're not gonna count at all, uh, but you can count some. But then a subset of that is, uh, I mean, you know, we can enumerate some of the things, but not, how many of those things do we actually know something about? Like, can we actually service? Uh, is it, who's tracking what device or, you know, is, other devices out there that no one's tracking. I think that's certainly the case. Then a subset of that is, is where you have the actual resources uh, to go manage that set of devices. Then even smaller than that is when we actually make the choice to say, I am going to actively, actively manage this set of devices as a part of this IoT system or these two IoT systems. So the number of things we actually manage is pretty small relative to the, the, the number of things that are coming on. And I think we have to acknowledge that. So some examples of things found on some um, uh, university uh, campuses. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, there's, there's tons of um, a classroom AV that's, uh, that's exposed. Uh, I've got a slide here in a minute on Shodan and Census we can talk about for a second, but some of the stuff I found, I found with that, which they, and they just scan public IP addresses, which for 
that are and they look for banners are saying, you know, what's how are you advertising yourself? But um, uh, lots of uh, classroom AV. Like in the lower left hand corner, that's some uh, uh, that's out of a big research lab, and there's lots of that kind of thing. And that's just like one bank of that could be like one one hundredth of something that's in a particular lab. Uh, there's remote access to power management, to power control, to power switching, uh, backup power. Uh, that device uh, toward the middle of the left is kind of kind of red there. I don't even know what it is, but it's it's. I looked it up online. I don't know what it's doing, but it's connected to the network. It's advertising itself. I, I think it had the default username and the password on it, but it's doing some kind of IR control over the network. Well, what IR control? And why is it advertising itself? Um, uh, that Landtronics device up toward the top is another one. So there, there's just a, a number of different devices that are out there. And of course, there's zillions of printers out there. Uh, other examples are, um, uh, there's clinical devices, you know, uh, blood glucose monitors often comes up. There's Alexas, our Raspberry Pis, our Arduinos, you know, the, the lights that you can, uh, you can control over the network and sometimes tied in like with your Alexa or HomePod or whatever. Drones, of course, is another one. So we just got tons of this stuff that can come from a variety of different places. And some of this stuff is so inexpensive. I mean, the, you know, the small uh, Alexas or Google Homes, they're like 30 bucks. You know, you can pick that up at Best Buy, stick it in your pocket and bring it on campus. So some uh, historical outcomes of IoT systems that uh, weren't deployed well. The one on the left, and that's from uh, an image is from uh, Brian Krebs' site. This is a couple of years ago, where a bunch of uh, closed circuit uh, TVs, you know, video surveillance cameras, as well as the digital video recorders, they were there was a, a part of a big botnet, and they went after some uh, DNS servers and shut down some things for a while. I mean, Twitter, Netflix, Wall Street Journal, a bunch of big sites. Um, you know, of course, people start paying attention when when Netflix goes down. But they, but this wasn't this was an IoT botnet where they used devices to go do an attack. The um, the in the middle of the the Jeep hack y'all heard about before. And then the bottom there's uh, uh, I think that was a uh, uh, some kind of heart device. Some was a pacemaker, or not, but a heart device. And there's uh, some compromise there. The uh, uh, the text there on the right hand side in the Verizon data breach report of a couple of years ago, there was an unnamed university that uh, had. Uh, a lot of it's uh, soda machines and I think lights were, they were attacking, I, th I think it was their DNS servers also, but they, and they were it was doing something silly, but it was like, uh, it was like doing requests for uh, like seafood restaurants, but it was a, a, a DDoS attack and it actually slowed or uh, rendered inoperable uh, parts of that university's network for some period of time. And uh, there's a, a notable quote in there to me in, in the middle where the, uh, the guy that was reporting on it said, you know, we had, for our regular stuff, you know, for our server racks, for our, um, our, tr our traditional applications, we had processes and procedures, but for IoT stuff, we didn't have anything. Uh, we, we didn't know how to handle it. And I, I think that's, that's the boat a lot of us are in. And finally, that one at the top there, this uh, 2008 Turkish pipeline explosion, this one's interesting to me because uh, they had the, it, it was malicious and it did have the, uh, it was, a, it was a malicious hack and it did have the outcome you just see there. But the interesting thing is they went in through um, the, the pipelines, uh, network video cameras, and it wasn't so much to spy on what was around them, but to use the, the, the fact that the network video cameras, it's a networked computing device. They use those as a jumping off point to get into the industrial control system. And then and they did something with valves or whatever and, and had that outcome. So that's the big thing to keep in mind is all these, all these devices, they can be used just for the computing and network part. You know, you know whatever they do with the environment, the, the bad guy might not care about. But just the fact we've got hundreds or thousands of these that might have been deployed poorly and might be undermanaged or unmanaged, uh, that's, the, that's the kind of thing we're trying to, we're trying to deal with. So uh, on this call, I think probably most people have seen these before. Uh, uh, Shodan, Shodan.io, and then there's another one called Census.io. Uh, Shodan's been around for at least 10 years. He scans the whole uh, public-facing internet 
uh, looking for things that look like IoT devices. He looks for certain ports. That, the port list now is uh, uh, probably two or 300 different ports that he looks for. And I, I think there's some other pieces to this. There's some things he's doing with certificates now as well. But if he sees something and something responds with a banner, he'll timestamp it, get the IP address, get the stuff that came back on the banner, collect some metadata on it, and make it publicly available on his website. And you can get on uh, for free. I mean, you can do that now. There's You can uh, pay some premiums to get some other services, some reporting services, and some other pieces. But overall, you can just get on for free. And he does offer uh, an academic package also, which has got some kind of uh, additional bells and whistles. <clears throat> then this, the one below is called Census, and that started out at the University of Michigan a few years ago, or uh, at least a few years ago. And they, they've since uh, spun off and are commercializing, so I'm not sure how much there is free now, but they do a similar thing, but they do it with a different approach. So uh, Shodan.io, Census.io, if you uh, haven't uh, checked into those before, it it's, can be interesting to just to go map some of your own local uh, network address space and kind of see what you see what comes up. So on, for me, I think there's, a, there's a many different definitions for IoT and Internet of Things. But for me, what I stick to is a, a thing, the, the thing in Internet of Things, the T in IoT, is a device that computes, it's networked, and it senses and or interacts with the world in some way, with, the, with its local environment. So it computes, it's networked, and interacts with its local environment in some way. A system, in turn, it have, will have many of these devices. Could be tens, hundreds, thousands, or more. Oftentimes, there's some kind of uh, server or service that serves as a data aggregator, and/or it could be it helps configure the devices as well. Then it goes off to some kind of data processing and maybe some analytics, and then yields the data in some way. So most IoT systems that we see look kind of like this. Now I know there's there's mesh systems and uh, I know them and there will be more of that coming forward, but most of it kind of looks like this. There's a bunch of devices, there's some kind of data aggregation and maybe some device configuration central place, and they do something with the data, then they make the data available again. And that's and that's and a, one of the approaches I'm taking here at the UW is looking at systems because there's so many devices. Uh, let's, I'm trying to, let's say, at least start with systems and then uh, go to devices from there. So th this is an, uh, an important aspect, this idea of OT or operational technology. And I'll just be old enough on the call to remember that advertisement on the left from a, for Reese's peanut butter cups, but was, the punchline was, you got chocolate in my peanut butter, you got peanut butter on my chocolate. But there's a similar kind of thing happens with with the skill sets that are needed to deploy these devices. So on one side, we've got uh, the, the traditional trades and shops, uh, you know, electricians, plumbers, carpenters, uh, traditional engineering. And the other side, you've got IT. And they're very different, they're very uh, different kinds of organizations, but they're being just thrust together all, the, all of a sudden. And that skill set that can do both is really in short supply. So on the, on the uh, culturally, they're, they're, they're very different. I mean, so for the traditional trades and shops, I mean, they've been around for decades. You could argue centuries or even you know, millennia if you're, you know, you're, if you're counting you know, carpentry as a skilled trade, and it, and it is. With traditional IT, it's been around for what, three decades, four decades? Not much more than that. And there's even differences in like um, perceptions of time. So on the, on the trade side and people that are, that are supporting, uh, that are putting up and supporting buildings and facilities and the built environment, they, they tend to think in terms of decades because they, they need that building to run for decades. IT people tend to think in terms of days and minutes, uh, hours, very, very different time frames, And there's different perceptions of uh, change also. On the traditional, uh, trade sides and the people that are that are managing and supporting and maintaining buildings in the built environment you know Whitney, one of the things i learned when i first started working at facilities was that uh you could be standing there with a the facilities person they could be pointing you point to a building and they'll say you know if there's heat getting to that building if there's electricity getting to that building you don't touch it you leave it alone with the heat and electricity will keep getting to that building so there's this real resistance to change which is understandable because that's 
those things need to be there. But on the IT side, we're used to change all the time. You're constantly doing patches, you're doing configuration changes. Some of that's in, in response to vulnerability. Some of it's in response to something else. But there's that how we how we perceive change is very different. And then in, in, even the, the language that we use, we just we have these different different ways of communicating with each other. And when also we're, we're thrust together <coughs> to, to de deploy an IOT device, so take for an example, uh, uh, we've got over a couple thousand energy meters across campus here, so over 6,000 data points, and that number is growing quite rapidly. But some of these meters, they're, the, uh, they're, they're complex meters. And I, there's, I think there's probably an embedded Linux uh, OS on the inside. But that thing has to be, you have to have someone that can do high voltage, that can program a computer, test a computer, uh, and commission a computer, it, along with the, you know, the high voltage aspect. People that can do both are hard to find. They, because they're, they're, the backgrounds are very different. Uh, electricians ha haven't been, that's not how they've been trained and what their experience is. Traditional IP, IT people aren't used to installing something up on top of a pole or in, or in a boiler room or underground. So that, that um, people that could do both, uh, that's in short supply. And in the course of this, I think a lot about that phrase, that Drucker phrase, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Because it's, and I think that's so true, is that because a lot of times people have, a, will have big ideas of this is what we're gonna do with our IoT system, or you know, I have had all this experience because I, I implemented this for Microsoft back you know, in you know, 2009 or whatever. But they don't understand the, the environment, the uh, working with working with trades and working with where these devices will be deployed, and if we don't pay attention to that culture, we have a real hard time getting things done. Um, so anyway, that, that that cultural piece it's it's a it's a big one. Uh, so one other thing on that the rate of growth on network segmentation. Uh, so I think the number of network segments is going to grow rapidly too. And so, and when we have a network segment, it takes some resources to manage it. Uh, it takes some, it takes some, some level of staffing, some documentation, some technical resources and some ongoing oversight. So, you know, what, a lot of times people in conversations will jump to, well, we'll, we'll use network segmentation to deal with the IOT issue. Well, again, there's places for that. I mean, we, we you know, we do it here too, of course. Uh, but my concern is, is that it managing those network segments takes resources also. So what if that rate of growth is also exponential? Uh, you know, we're not going to, we're not starting off with this. There's not as many network segments as there are devices, of course, but, but, but let's say we've got 500 network segments now. Uh, what's that rate of growth look like? What if that's exponential also? Um, maybe not, maybe not at 20%, but how, will our resources be able to continue to manage that? And when we don't have the resources to manage these things, they became undermanaged or unmanaged, and that's really where we get into trouble, I believe. So going across the top there, the IoT systems have a life cycle. Now, this, is the way, uh, this is the way I see it. Uh, there's a, there's a IoT system selection phase, there's a procurement phase, there's an implementation and deployment phase, then there's a management and operation phase, and then a retirement phase. And then we're, <coughs> excuse me, and the retirement phase is important, but we're not seeing as much of that yet uh, because these things are still fairly new, but they will be important because who's going to take all the systems out? But in each of these phases, you go down the left-hand side there, there's a, a number of those different organizations or groups within a uh, institution or um, uh, city. So what we wanna do to, to, ma to mature in our ability to deploy and manage IoT systems, we wanna get these groups coordinated better. So we have to get some expectation setting, some coordination, some accountability. But right now, most organizations aren't good at doing this. But, th but this is a place where we can get better, and this is a place where we can take steps, and that's one of the things we're working on here, and I can talk about it in a minute. So um, 
across that top bar on life cycles, the same IoT system life cycle we just talked about, but there's also building life cycles. Um, <coughs> and these are, and, and roughly those phases are pre-design, design, design the, the build and construction, operate and maintain, and then you re retire building. And this is typically over decades. But these, they both have life cycles, but they don't align, they don't match one to one. These IoT systems can come in at any place in a building's life cycle. Uh, Pre-designed design could come in during the, when the construction is already going on, it could come in after it's already up and it's being operated and maintained. And where the IoT system comes in, in the building's life cycle matters. There, there's different, um, and you don't get to choose generally, um, uh, but there's different considerations depending on when it comes in. So on, on manageability, one of the things I, I work on here um, is I, I want us to ask ourselves before we go deploy our next system, what do we already have? How, <coughs> excuse me, how good are we at managing what we already have in place? <clears throat> so before we go install that next system, how many systems do we have? How many endpoints are already out there? Can we give ourselves a report card on how we're doing already? Are we actually managing that system? So questions we can ask is that for each of these IoT systems, how many servers or services are required to support that? How many, you know, we have cloud applications. Uh, where are they? Who's actually managing them? Are they being managed? Is that going okay? We can ask the same thing about for an IoT system. How many desktop client applications are there? Where are they? Who is managing those? And then devices. Uh, where are they? Who is managing those? And this, it, it, you know, on the devices, when you have an IoT system that, that has hundreds or thousands or more of devices, finding out what, the, what some of that stuff is can be hard. It's, I mean, it's just not yet. It sounds like it's easy just to go uh, enumerate them all, like everyone knows where everything is. But when you, we deploy these things by the thousands and tens of thousands, sometimes devices start to get lost. People don't know where they are. And I, and I think, we want to be aware of that with ourselves. We want to be aware that we don't have quite the control on this that we think we might. Then we also want to ask before we buy another system is, you know, how many do we think we're going to buy in the next year, year and a half? So that's going to add obviously to what we've already got to the purchase we're about to make. So let's be honest with ourselves, like say, how, how many do we think we're going to have in a year and a half? You know, for these systems, are there, uh, is there a single owner? Is there a technical owner, is there a business or a client owner, or is the ownership shared? Does someone that's the owner know that they're actually the owner? I mean, that happens sometimes too. You can be in meetings and they'll point to someone else that's not in the room and says, well, that person or that organization is the, is the owner. But, and that gets back to this thing about we're not, as institutions, we're not great at this yet. We're not great at coordinating across our institution uh, to make these, to ensure we've got ownership and management. And this and the same thing about device count. Just we want some self awareness. So uh, when we when we find devices, one thing on that what we don't want to do. I'm going to talk about how we're going into our strategy here in a, a couple a couple of slides. But what we don't want to do is get in this whack a mole game. There's, there's, we got to do some whack a mole, but we don't want that to be our strategy because the devices and then the counts are going to be so high. But rather, what's interesting is that when we find a device that's publicly exposed or exposed in some other way. Let's ask ourselves, how did that device get there? What processes allowed that exposed device to show up where it showed up? Or what lack of processes did? Uh, one comment on this, um, <coughs> a year ago, so I was asked to testify at this uh, US China Economic and Security uh, Review Commission. And they, among other things, they asked me to, to do some recommendations and uh, identify some, a couple of risks and some recommendations. So what I said during that testimony at a national level, I, I said uh, I, there's three broad uh, risks, supply chain, uh, poor selection, procurement, implementation, and management of IoT systems, which is what we've been talking about today, and then a lack of institutional governance and awareness of, of, uh, of these systems. And I think that's still a reasonable uh, set of risks to consider. And for, they, they had asked what could the government do to help mitigate some of this? And I said some kind of method for uh, for vetting of all those IoT components, like some, at, least, at least reporting, some kind of standardized way of reporting what components go into an IoT device. And then from there, ostensibly, 
you could come closer to dividing, uh, uh, coming up with a system for um, uh, for, for doing uh, broader vetting. Uh, the second one was uh, increased uh, was government support for development of U.S. labor force and this operational technology skill set. I, I, I do believe that's, and they were interested in national security and other things. I do believe that's that's an issue because when these skill sets aren't there, the, those skills that can do both that that traditional trade stuff and engineering stuff with and some IT stuff, those that can do both, that's in short supply. And when they are in short supply, when these systems get deployed, they tend to be undermanaged or unmanaged. And then from a, from a cyber point of view um, and from ROI, that's very, very problematic. Uh, and I ask them to support uh, you know, cities and institutions that they develop uh, IoT governance frameworks because people are kind of on their own right now trying to figure things out. I mean, NIST does some work here and that's great. <clears throat> the thing is with, with NIST documents, you know, they're, oftentimes they're, their audiences are, are, are pretty broad and, they're, and, they're, and they're, they're great detailed documents, almost academic, uh, but you still, have to, you still have to turn them into something. You still have to uh, make, make them apply to your area. So there, there's a lot of room we can do for, a lot of things we can do regarding uh, institutional and city governance around IoT issues. And that last one's a, uh, support this, this data ethnography and socio-technical research regarding these IoT and cyber physical systems. Because we really don't know how, as a, as a population, whether it's students, faculty, staff at a university or the public in the city or uh, uh, staff in a lab, we, we don't, we don't, um, the change is so big, we don't know yet how the, the uh, we'll interact with that data, what we'll do with that data. I think it's going to be much more complex and nuanced uh, than it uh, uh, may seem at the surface. So uh, uh, real quick, a couple of things. I chaired this uh, IoT Risk Management Task Force for Internet 2, a group for Internet 2 a couple years ago. And out of that, we had some, uh, we came up with some like a, a little checklist that different organizations could use when they're deploying an IoT system. Uh, and I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a good first step. I've done some work on it uh, since then. And, and, then, and in fact, on this book that I've got coming out this summer, I've kind of advanced this a little bit. But the, but the general idea is like, what, are some, what are some things that different groups can think about when you're deploying an IoT system? So in this uh, newly created role that I'm in here at the University of Washington, what I'm, what I'm roughing out now is a, is a, a strategy and then a program to support that strategy for IoT risk mitigation across the university. And I break it down into four broad categories. One is policy, another ed education awareness, outreach and assistance, uh, another is institutional awareness and threat awareness, and the fourth is interorganizational coordination. The, um, on the policy part, there's, there's a number of places where that can come into play. They can come into play at a really high level. It can come into play at uh, something called, for example, building design guides. And that's, I'm doing some work there now, with, which sets some, uh, some criteria and some standards for when a building is constructed or, or remodeled or maybe a new lab is put in. It sets some criteria for when we put in these systems, what are some minimal expectations that we have for that contractor or that vendor? Um, in the education awareness and outreach piece, <coughs> excuse me, I, uh, a lot of this is going on in meeting with the different constituents across campus. Because, <clears throat> and, and this has to do with, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to co-evolve language together so we can see IoT systems from our different perspectives and start to talk about them in a known way. And there's also opportunity here to help out when IoT systems get acquired. So for example, if a PI uh, gets a big, hypothetically gets a $3 million research grant from NIH, and as a part of that, they've got to put in a, a video surveillance system, a, a door access system, a lab automation system, and maybe an environmental monitoring system. Right now, 
that PI really doesn't get any guidance about what to get. Um, and the only, well, the only group that gives them guidance is the vendor. And the vendor says, yeah, this is what you need, put this in. So there's some things I'm working on there to where we can, we can help that PI uh, make good decisions. And I think they'll be motivated, they'll, I think they'll appreciate the help because they want to spend their money well. But right now, it, they're kind of in the dark. So there's opportunity to make that better. <clears throat> on uh, self-awareness and threat awareness, uh, the, th the threat awareness part is kind of some of the more traditional CISO stuff, like uh, who is it that's trying to get in, where are they trying to get, maybe trying to figure out why they're trying to get where they are. There's that piece. But there's also this self-awareness, like what stuff do we have? What stuff is on our networks? What stuff has just shown up? That someone went out and used a, a corporate credit card to buy an IoT system that's showing up. Or someone, there's some of the kind of path to procurement, and now there's an IoT system that's on some subset of the networks. Let's, I want us to get better at knowing what's, what we have on the networks. I, you know, it's, it's won't be perfect, but we can get better. And the last one is interorganizational coordination. And that's that one I was gonna, uh, talking about a few slides back where we have all these different organizations that are involved and it, there's, there's ways that we can communicate with each other and at the right point in time when, and for example, buildings are going up or a lab's being remodeled or there, there's things we can do to coordinate better and I think that will help to mitigate some of our risk. Now that one's, um, I think that was important, but it's also, it's, it's also hard because it, it involves human and organizational behavior. But I think there's some, there's some uh, work we can do there. Okay, so um, I'm open for questions, comments, discussion. All right, well, thank you so much, Chuck. That was really scary, but also really great. Uh, a lot of good things in there. We did have one question come in already uh, from Joe Breen at Utah. Do you think the cost scale of certain IoT implementations is also quite different than traditional enterprise, i.e. industrialized systems tend to have larger single unit costs for sensors and equipment than the servers and devices in a data center? Um, I, I'm not sure, I don't know if I can, answer that if I can compare the total cost to total cost. I, what I, I guess the part that I emphasize the most is that, is that endpoint cost. It's a, it's a lot more than people generally realize um, because you're deploying these things in a, in a variety of different places and they're, they're small computers. And I, it's that, I think there's a lot of cost that we don't capture. So I don't, I can't answer that question directly, but I, I do think with these IoT systems, there's a lot of uncaptured cost that um, uh, that we need to get better at capturing. Okay. And I'll remind everybody, if you have questions, just type them into the chat room. I jotted down a couple here to sort of get us started. Uh, I was particularly intrigued by the uh, the software stack uh, well, actually, it's sort of the, the entire system stack that you were showing uh, early in the slide deck of, uh, you know, hardware and the various libraries and, and things that are built on top of that. Are you seeing uh, sort of common sharing of, of that middle software section across these different platforms? And the reason I ask is that, you know, are, are you seeing sort of common risks and exploits that are spreading across a larger section of these devices because they share those components or is that not something that is rather common and everybody's sort of building their own? No, I, I think that's, um, I, I think that's, that's, that is a real risk. There's a, I think I didn't have it on this slide, but there's, for example, there's a, um, a company called, or software called Allegro, A-L-L-E-G-R-O. So they, I was doing a lot of Shodan scans a few years ago and I kept seeing them pop up. But then I started diving into them a little bit. So they, they are a company that writes um, web services or web servers for devices. Um, because, you know, so you're making a device that does X, you're making someone else make a device that does Y. You know, they're, they're, they're putting all the resources into their particular thing and why their device is special. They might not want to go develop out, you know, their, their own web services. So they'll, they'll go buy it from somebody else. So I think that does, I think that does open the door uh, for exploits that could cross cut across a number of different uh, providers and a number of different types of devices. Now, I, I haven't seen that yet, but it seems like it's a thing that could happen because a vulnerability in that, and I'm, I'm not picking on those guys, I mean, they, it's a fine product, I'm sure. Um, 
but a vulnerability in an organization or a group that sells to multiple different parties is going to show up in multiple different parties. Okay. Uh, Florence Hudson types into the chat room, uh, can you share the journey that you and UW have gone on to get to the current focus on IoT security and what sounds like an, a newly announced role for you? Do you imagine other organizations might take a similar path? Well, Florence, good to hear from you. I mean, we haven't talked in a while. Um, it, yeah, and, and it's it's been a uh, it's 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 been work. I mean, it's not been bad, but it's been work. So I, about five years ago, I we uh, put together a task force with that looked at industrial control issues on campus, risk mitigation on industrial control. I did, um, and then Florence and I met somewhere about three years ago, and I chaired this task force uh, with her group with Internet Two. And that was a national group. And then we had we had another uh, task force here, which was kind of similar to the first one, uh, except a little more senior. Where I had kind of I had AVPs involved. And out of that, we did uh, we 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 had topics. We created um, we we created a report at the end. We uh, this last one, in fact, reported up to our regents. Um, yeah, and I think all that stuff was needed. So it, I mean, it was a four or five year path. Uh, because people just, they, they don't know what it is. Um, but you kind of, you know, you kind of keep coming back and you get more people involved and you start to co-evolve some language, uh, and you document your, your way forward. Um, it, it and also why that, that kind of approach is, uh, why, why it was needed here anyways, is because it does cross so many different organizations. It's not like the central IT group is going to jump in to solve this full problem. It's not like the facilities group is going to jump in and solve this full problem. It's not like the CISO is going to jump in to solve this full problem. It requires multiple organizations getting in the room uh, multiple times to start to figure out, I mean, we got kind of a common problem that we have to work on uh, together. Okay, thank you. I had uh, one more here that I was interested in knowing about. What's the thing that's keeping you up at night right now? What do you think is, is the the biggest risk, and you can frame this in, in the form of either a home consumer or a, a, a campus that's trying to monitor and mitigate these things. What's coming down the pike that we need to be concerned about, or what's something that we haven't really thought fully about right now? Um, I, I, I pay a lot of attention to this organizational stuff, because I think we, I mean, in, in our processes within a big institution, because in a way, we just, when I say we, I'm not just picking on UW, we've all got these issues, I think. Uh, we we kind of, with, without some process and some oversight, we kind of just keep cranking out targets. We, you know, we, keep, we, we buy another IoT system, we buy another IoT system, and we don't ask ourselves, are we actually managing these things? Did, were they deployed in a way that was healthy? Uh, and and we, just, we just kind of keep piling on. So it's the, it's the numbers of things and it's the manageability I, that's what concerns me is like, we want to throttle that somehow. Like, let's just, let's make some reasoned decisions before we go uh, install the next thousand batch of uh, network sensors all over the, the, the campus. So it's, it's just, it's the raw numbers, I think, that, that gets my attention. Because there's, you know, there's tons, there's a million different vulnerabilities on any different device or protocol or system. But it's just the fact, it's just the raw numbers, just the magnitude. Uh, and our ability to deal with that as an institution, uh, that's, that's where my concern is. All right. Well, I think we've exhausted the questions. I'll, I'll send out a thank you again for, for giving this talk. Great stuff. Um, we got one from Pete that just came in. All right. Pete Simpson says, I think we need to be careful about what we ask. The question how many devices do we have sounds reasonable, but may not help. At my site, the networking group was just asked by the security group to provide a list of IP addresses, names, and locations. In an internal discussion, the questions were, okay, why, if we produce the list, will we have to maintain it? What good is it really? It will take effort to produce. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think that's a very reasonable uh, statement. And it, it, to me, it ties back to that manageability thing. Can we actually, can we manage this? 
things. And if we can't, we want to say that to ourselves. We want to, we want to acknowledge it's like, yeah, we're going to bring another system and I don't know if we can manage it or not. Let's at least be upfront with ourselves. But I, I agree. And I don't, and I don't have any kind of fantasy here that I'm going to inventory every single device. There's, there's just no way, but, but, but there's, we can get better visibility than what we have now. And I want to move in that direction. All right. Well, thank you again, Chuck. Uh, I will make sure that this recording gets posted. And if you want to mail me your slides, I'll post those as well. And thanks to everybody who uh, joined today. Uh, we will not have a talk next week because the presenter uh, had some unexpected travel. So we will pick up again in two weeks. Hope everybody has a good weekend and we'll talk to you soon.